Thank you for joining us. We maintain an impartial position with regard to politics and frequently we have leaders from both the right and the left on our shows. These include Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Ted Deutsch, Newt Gingrich and leaders from Israel and elsewhere. The historic 2016 general elections are seen as more controversial and consequential than any before. Hillary Clinton is the first female presidential candidate and she's competing against Donald Trump in perhaps the largest gender gap in any presidential election ever. And we've invited both sides. Today we have Tony Holt Kramer, a friend of Hillary Clinton for over 16 years, and Robin Bernstein, a friend of Donald Trump. But first we have Mr. Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York, with his overview, and they'll all share their views in general following these messages. Find magic again. Sprout by HP. With Intel RealSense technology inside, now you can bend the rules of creativity outside. With us now is America's Mayor, Mr. Rudy Giuliani. It's a pleasure, sir. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. We actually met in New York City ages ago, but here we are today. <laughs> Interesting times in history. Oh, couldn't be more interesting, right? We're right, right down to the, right down to the wire of a, absolutely probably so. the most important election of our lifetime. Absolutely. How do you see the challenges facing the United States at this time? Well, I see um, the domestic challenges as getting an economy that should be growing at three, four percent on its feet. Uh, we're growing at only one percent, which is almost no growth. We have people who haven't had a raise in 10, 12 years. We have people out of work, people out of the workforce. And even the people who do have jobs, their jobs aren't paying them what, what they should. And I see a candidate, Donald Trump, who is an expert on how to create jobs, create good jobs. And I see an economic program that he has that reminds me a great deal of Ronald Reagan's, John Kennedy's, that will revive the economy by lowering taxes, bringing businesses back, renegotiating bad trade deals, reviving our energy industry. And I see a candidate on the other side who's more of the same, more of Barack Obama uh, regulations going through the roof that drive businesses crazy, taxes going up or taking more money out of my pocket, maybe another 10, 20 percent. All of you at home should know if she becomes president, you might as well get ready for the fact that next year at this time, you'll be giving 20 percent more to the government. She wants to do socialized medicine. She's in favor of Obamacare. We know what a disaster now Obamacare is. That's the one side of it. Then I look on foreign policy, and I see a country that doesn't stand up to radical Islamic terrorism. Obama won't say the word. She won't say the word. They withdrew from Iraq, took all our troops out of there. They are among, as Donald Trump points out, the creators of ISIS. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have ISIS. Remember, he thought it was the JV. She advised the overthrow of Gaddafi which probably was one of the dumbest decisions any Secretary of State ever made. And Libya went from a place that, okay, Gaddafi was a bad guy, but he had been pretty much neutered. He had been bombed by Reagan. We had taken his weapons of mass destruction away. He's a problem for his own people, but he wasn't a problem for us. He wasn't a problem for Israel. And what, what, what did we do? We created a tremendous problem for us, for Israel, and for the world uh, by overthrowing him. Now it's a, one of the big headquarters for ISIS, one of their 30. And we lost four brave Americans because she was too lazy to do her job as Secretary of State. The, the woman should go to bed at night praying to God for forgiveness for losing the lives of those four brave Americans in Libya because that compound was under attack so often she was asked for help, she never gave it. And they never sent anybody there to help him when he was being attacked and being killed. I mean, that's disgraceful. 
That's even worse than all the criminal crime acts that she, com that she committed that are now coming out. How do you see the difference with regard to Israel between an administration with Hillary Clinton or one with Trump? Well, I think this administration of Barack Obama's, of which she was a big part, she was Secretary of State for four years, has been the worst administration for Israel in the history of the state of Israel. I don't think there's ever been a time in the history of the state of Israel when there hasn't been an American president who was right there, right beside the Prime Minister of Israel. They didn't always agree, but when it came down to big things, they had each other's back. You can go ask anybody in Israel, Barack Obama does not have Israel's back. You don't sign an agreement with the Ayatollah, let them become a nuclear power in 10 years, and claim that you care about the existence of the state of Israel. And as a Secretary of State, she supported that. As a candidate for president, she supports it. Donald Trump is against it. He believes it's the dumbest agreement that was ever made by the United States. He will disregard it and renegotiate it. And if he doesn't get a non-nuclear Iran, he's not gonna sign anything. Because Donald Trump believes that the Ayatollah with atomic weapons is insanity. Insanity for Israel, insanity for Saudi Arabia, insanity for the region and for the United States. What are your views with regard to health care? There's so much in the news nowadays. Well, my views with regard to health care is that Obamacare was one of the biggest frauds ever perpetrated on the American people by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, who voted for it and supported it as a senator. Uh, President Obama and Hillary Clinton promised us that we could keep our own doctor. A lie. We can't. They promised us that we could keep our insurance if we liked it. A lie. 25 million people have lost their insurance. They promised us that cost would go down. Costs are going up anywhere from 25 to 100 percent in premiums this year. Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton's husband, said, says about Obamacare, it is crazy. Crazy. The premiums are too high. The deductibles are too high. And it's going bankrupt. And she wants to add four, four times more people to it. So she can really bankrupt it. So she can do what she said she wants to do in one of those secret speeches she gave for $225,000, the ones they WikiLeaks got from her. She told a Canadian bank that she, what she really wants is socialized medicine for the U.S. Now, I'm sorry, Americans do not want socialized medicine. Nobody from America goes to Canada for treatment or to England or Germany. A lot of people from England, Germany, and Canada come to the U.S. for treatment because we like our private health care system. So Donald Trump will repeal Obamacare with a Republican House and Senate, and he'll replace it with 50-state competition for insurance. See, right now, I'm a, New I'm a New Yorker. I have to buy my insurance in New York. If I like a policy in Nebraska, I can't buy the policy in Nebraska. It might be the one that fits me perfectly. So what, what the Ob Obama-Clinton people have done is they've set up monopolies in each of the states, some states, there's only one insurance company. Insurance companies charge you anything they want. So what he wants to do is to get rid of Obamacare, which, by the way, you could easily get rid of. 65% of the American people are against it. And replace it with 50-state competitive medical insurance, like we have competitive car insurance. So we drive the price down. And we drive it down to a level that people can afford. The very best thing for driving prices down and keeping quality up is massive competition. Another concern many people have has to do with tax reform. What are your views on that? Uh, she is not in favor of tax reform. She's in favor of what she calls raising taxes on the rich to 45 percent, except the rich include all small businesses. And to do what she wants to do, all the promises that she's made, she can't just raise taxes on the rich. <laughs> <clears throat> because there aren't enough rich. So she'll do the same thing Obama did. He said he was only going to raise taxes on the rich. He raised taxes on everybody. I guarantee you, anyone listening to this program, next year at this time, you will be giving 20 to 25 percent more of your paycheck to the federal government than you were giving today. Because her program is, for every program, her answer is, I'm going to tax. I'm going to tax. I'm going to tax. I've heard her say it so often, it's gotten up to about 25 percent now. Donald Trump's program is just the opposite. It borrows from Ronald Reagan and John Kennedy. They both did this. They lowered taxes dramatically. He's going to do the same thing. 
lower taxes for everyone, mostly the middle class, but for everyone, including the rich, because we want the rich to be able to spend their money. What, what, what the socialists, like Hillary Clinton, don't understand is when people have more disposable income, they buy things, and then we create more jobs. When businesses have more money, and we take our business tax rate down from 35%, the highest in the world, to 15%, we're going to have a lot more businesses stay in the United States, come back to the United States. Why do you think Pfizer goes and builds its factory in Ireland? Because the tax on Ireland is 12%. The tax in the U.S. is 35%. You get that tax rate down, you're going to see millions of new jobs. And it worked for Ronald Reagan, years of prosperity. It worked for John Kennedy. And it's been a disaster for Obama. His raising of taxes has held back our recovery. Our recovery since the recession has been pathetic. 1%, 2%. A country our size can't grow at 1% or 2%. And does anybody feel it? We have to grow at 3 and 4 and 5% to have people feel it, to get people not only jobs, but good jobs. We have young youngsters, the millennials, right? They're graduating from college. They can't get a job. Or well, if they get a job, they can't get a good job. Uh, part of the reason for that is Barack Obama. It's because he's laid on so many taxes and so many regulations on American business that he's driven those businesses out of the United States. Plus, we can also thank the Clintons for NAFTA, in which we've lost millions of jobs to Mexico and hundreds of millions of dollars. You go to a state like Michigan, you go to a state like Ohio, there are people out of work and their factory moved to Mexico. So the current administration has appointees in different tasks in the cabinet, and people are concerned with whom Hillary Clinton might have around her if she were to win. Considering her friends, to many voters, it's a major concern based on friends and so forth. And who do you believe Donald well, Trump Well, I have? think it, I think if you just contemplate the Hillary Clinton presidency, it's a disaster for the United States. First of all, she'll be under investigation for two years. It'll be like Watergate. And I'm, a, I'm an ex-prosecutor. I know she's guilty. I mean, I can read the papers. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that ultimately she's going to have to go to jail. Uh, Whitewater was one of the big worldwide scams, taking money from dictators, murderers, uh, people who, who beat up women, people who kill women. Uh, I mean, it was disgusting what they did in Whitewater. And it wasn't just them. It's a whole band. They're like an organized crime family. Uh, the FBI now has found another 650,000 emails on the server of uh, Congressman Weiner, a sexual pervert, that some of them are hers. Uh, she's definitely going to be under investigation. She's surrounded by people that she can't bring into government. They all took the Fifth Amendment. Everybody around her has refused to answer questions on the grounds that it might tend to incriminate them. <laughs> you can't bring somebody like that into government. Uh, none of the people around it could pass a background check. They've all been, I mean, one of them used a hammer to break up cell phones. Another one's used acid to destroy emails after they were subpoenaed by Congress. I mean, she, she couldn't get hired for the government and pass a background check. I mean, that doesn't apply to a presidential candidate, but if Donald Trump got elected and he wanted to hire her for a job, which of course he wouldn't, but if he did, he couldn't hire her because she's been extremely careless with national security information, which would deprive her of the top security clearance. In fact, they shouldn't be briefing her now. She's too irresponsible to have national security information. And she's surrounded by a group of criminals that could, couldn't possibly ever go into the White House. A guy like Doug Band, uh, Huma Abedin. Huma Abedin can't pass a background check for a couple of reasons. First of all, she held three jobs. She worked for the State Department, she worked for the Clinton Foundation, and she worked for the Teneo Corporation all at once. Well, the mere fact that she worked for the Clinton Foundation and the State Department shows you that the two things were tied together. They were one entity. They took the State Department and they turned it into a bribery vehicle for the Clinton Foundation. And Huma Abedin was at the core of that. She also now, it looks like, lied to the FBI in saying she turned over all of her emails because that server that they found 
was a joint server of both Huma Abedin and Anthony Weiner. So that's a straight out violation of f federal law. Plus, she was on a journal, I think it's called the Journal of Islamic Minority Affairs. Her mother is the editor of it. She was on the board of editors, which is a jihadist publication. I mean, it's advocated the overthrow of the state of Israel. It's advocated uh, jihad uh, to spread uh, Islam. Uh, you look at the articles in that magazine, and I would consider it uh, uh, pretty close to a terrorist manifesto. And she was on the board of that. You're going to give her a top security clearance? Not Mr. me. Mr. Mayor, before we conclude, what final message would you like to share with our audience with regard to how you would see the future of this well, great I, nation? The message I'd like to share with the people of your audience who are largely uh, you know, people of the Jewish faith is that this is a critical election for Israel and the continuance of Israel. This administration, which includes Hillary Clinton as the Secretary of State, have put the existence of the State of Israel at great risk by making an insane agreement with the Ayatollah, and also by being much more friendly and much more accommodating to the enemies of Israel than to the State of Israel. First time that's ever happened, Republican or Democratic president. This is not a year to vote as a Democrat or a Republican. This is a year to vote as an American, who is better for America? And if you have a great love for the state of Israel and you realize the importance of the existence of the state of Israel to the Jewish people, as I do, then you have no choice. You cannot vote for a continuation of Barack Obama's policies under Hillary Clinton. You have to vote for Donald Trump, who has always been a friend of Israel, who disavows the agreement with Iran, who is going to stand up to radical Islamic terrorism, who has a close and warm relationship with Prime Minister Netanyahu and with the Jewish people. And we will go back to what we've normally had, which is two very good friends, America and Israel, with a president and a prime minister who can work together rather than uh, who are at odds with each other. And I consider Barack Obama to have been the worst president for Israel that we've had a, ever had. I actually consider him to be one of the worst presidents we've ever had for America, too. Sir, it's been an honor and pleasure you. to have you on the show. Thank, Thank you so very, very much. I'll be right back. With us now is Tony Holt Kramer and Robin Bernstein. A real pleasure to have you pleasure. on the show today. Richard, so happy you're here. Absolutely. Great day. Just a great day. I would say so. This is so interesting. What an odd time in history with the politics in this country. A few moments here before the general election, the most unique elections, I guess, in American history. And here I am with a Jewish lady and another friend of Hillary Clinton, actually, and a friend of Donald Trump. And things seem to fluctuate a little in this world. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we're very excited, uh, speaking as one of the co-chairs for uh, Donald Trump's women's group in Florida. Uh, we see tremendous enthusiasm. We, we're seeing a shift away from Hillary, uh, solidifying Mr. Trump's votes, especially in the women's community. Absolutely. Uh, and even in the Jewish community, we had uh, 800 people at, uh, with Ivanka at a shul in, in Bell Harbor. So we're seeing a lot of movement, enthusiasm. It's just very, very exciting. And we know he's going to win. Tony, what are your thoughts on this? Well, my thoughts on this are very, it's first of all, we don't really have a choice anymore. You know, whether or not Donald Trump was your choice, it doesn't really matter anymore. Your choice has to be saving America. And we cannot afford, we cannot afford to be the laughing stock of the world. We cannot afford to see our country continue to go down the way it has been the past eight years. And I realize that a lot of people have been born and raised with a certain mandate in their head about, you know, we have to vote Democrat. It's just the, the, the history of our lives. It's the history of our family. Well, that may have been the case, but at this point in time, and even eight years ago, it shouldn't have been that. But at this point in time, I like to bring out that there's a huge difference between what was the Democratic Party and what is the Socialist Progressive Party today, which is a monumental difference. 
And a lot of people that might have voted Democrat years ago should not even con contemplate it today. Today, you have to look at the candidate. Forget about the parties. Republican, Democrat, Socialist, Progressive, it means nothing today. It's only one person, there's only one person out there that can truly change this country and save it. That can save it in a million different ways and I can ramble on and tell you each and every one of them but I don't want to step on your time. But I can tell you that Donald Trump is the one you have to vote for. You have to vote for him if you believe that you want to see America safe, alive, growing, have a good economy, get jobs, be not afraid of going to a movie theater or sending your children to school. We cannot afford terrorism. We cannot afford disrespect for law and order. We must protect our Supreme Court, and everybody understands that. Tony, this must be a little awkward for you because for 16 years you've been a close personal friend of Hillary Clinton, and yet circumstances in the world seem to change and views apparently change. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a good, it's a good point. First of all, I'd like to say that I have known Hillary Clinton for 16 years. You're absolutely correct. Uh, but I, was, I did not get to know her politically. At that time when I met her, I was very involved in my Hollywood career, which I had been for 25 years. And I went to Washington and I thought, gee, I might like to get into doing some Washington news as well as Hollywood. Anyway, as fate and circumstances have it, uh, the first weekend I was in Washington, I was entertained by the Clintons at the last night at the White House. I was entertained by George W. Bush at the Library of Congress and on and on at the you know different events for him. So I had a rather stunning weekend there. But the reality is that I never was politically embroiled because my interests were not there at the time. And I liked Hillary as a girlfriend. I, didn't, I knew her. But in no way, shape, or form could I, in the last eight years, put my support behind her. And I saw what happened then through the years. I started to see the change in our country, the change in our economy, the change in jobs, the change in respect for law and order, the change. We didn't talk about ISIS eight years ago. We didn't know about ISIS. Now, all of a sudden, we're hearing about people having these terrible atrocities, heads cut off, and nobody will attack it as, as being what it is, radical Islamic terrorism. All of these things started to weigh on me, and all of a sudden, I found myself becoming politically active. And in my head, first it started in my head, and then as time went on, I was watching Mr. Trump around the club for a number of years, and you know, as an interviewer, Richard, like yourself, you, you have a sense about people. And I had a sense about him that he would be the one. I mentioned it to him a number of times. I'd walk by the table with Ian Melania and just say, you know, you really should be president. What about Israel? Oh, so important. Yes, well, uh, I've, we've had the pleasure of knowing that uh, Mr. Trump and his family for over two decades now, almost 23 years. Our, our children are the same age. They, they pretty much grew up together. Um, during their, their lives. Our, my twins are the same age as Tiffany. Um, but I've known him to be an avid uh, supporter of Israel. His daughter is Jewish. She married an Orthodox uh, young man. His, uh, their three children are Jewish. His club has admitted, I, I would say, a good probably over 50% of his members, at least in Mar-a-Lago and Trump International. I don't know about the other clubs, but I know they are Jewish. I know that he tried to have a kosher kitchen. Uh, it was voted down, but he did want to have a kosher kitchen for his members. Um, so he, his, his staff uh, in New York, he's got a lot of Jewish people that, is, uh, that have surrounded him. So on, on any types of issues involving is, uh, Israel, I am sure that he would be 100% in, in Israel's I uh, court. Uh, I've never heard him say anything uh, derogatory. He's always supported his Jewish members. We have fundraisers. Well, uh, without him, I don't think we'd have a club in Palm Beach that was open to Jews. Uh, and by the way, I am half Jewish too, so don't leave me out. <laughs> and um, 
Uh, I don't think we would because a lot of clubs here on the island are not open to, for, to Jewish people for membership and Mr. Trump's club is open and, and, not, and for, for all minorities, as long as the people are worthy people and good people, I know they're welcome. That's true, and, and to embellish upon that, it is a very diverse membership. We have African Americans. We, I think, I'm sure we have at least uh, uh, Muslims. We yes. have Native Americans, yes. uh, Hispanics. Um, it is such a diverse, what international people from all over the world come to his clubs, and uh, he does not discriminate in any way, shape, or form in terms of gender, um, ethnicity. Uh, and it's a wonderful club to belong to. He's I'm a very kind, proud. honest, yes. sincere, loyal, very loyal person, right? Yes. Loyal gentleman uh, with a wonderful family. I, it speaks volumes. Ladies, uh, this is an interesting time in history, as I said earlier. And by the way, we have to remain impartial on the Shalom Show for decades now. So we're not taking sides. Tony, you actually are the founder of the Trumpets. Mm -hmm. Tell us about women's support for Donald. Well, actually, it's my girlfriend, Terry Lee Ebert Mendoza, and I, and our husbands were uh, vacationing together, as it happened, uh, on my birthday in the middle of the Mediterranean on a cruise ship, and Mr. Trump announced. And it was my birthday, and I, said, I turned around and I said, that's the best birthday present I ever got. And Terry and I decided, this was June, and we talked all summer about how can we get women involved? We need to get women. We really have to reach women, not just our girlfriends. We need to reach women all over the country. Not only that, besides safety, but we want our husbands and our children's husbands to know when they, they want job security. Right. They, we have a $19 trillion deficit. And women, believe it or not, we are just as concerned about a, a growing $19 trillion, trillion dollar deficit as men. And because a lot of women are in charge of the checkbook, they know what That's they have right. to pay for groceries and child care. Obamacare, health care costs are out of, out of sight now. Uh, people are getting um, huge uh, premium increases on their insurance. They can't, in, they can't afford the price. And it will get worse. They can't afford prescription medicine. Uh, the deductibles mm -hmm. are going up. So these are all, the economic issues are women's issues as that's well. Right. And I think that's why the Trumpets, this movement, if you will, has grown just by leaps and bounds because that um, Tony has really hit a chord with women. And this is a movement that is, con that is growing, that continues to grow. And uh, women, I think in the end, will turn around and they will vote for Mr. Trump for that very Absolutely. reason. Absolutely. I want to thank you both so much thank for being you, with Richard, me today. Thank you, Richard, a pleasure, and thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Let's hope for the best for this great country, whatever indeed, the results indeed, are. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Thank you. Thank you.